My name is Martha Coakley, Williams class of 75. And this panel is one of a year long series of events commemorating the 200th anniversary of the founding of the Williams College Society of Alumni. Our society is the oldest alumni association in North America and quite possibly the world. We're spending this bicentennial year not only celebrating and grappling with our past, but also examining our present and imagining our future. Together, we envision an inclusive society where all alumni feel they belong. We are united in our shared commitment to a liberal arts education, to lifelong learning, and most especially to each other and to our college. Also a friendly reminder to all that this session is being recorded. So thanks for joining us tonight, friends from Williams, friends of Williams, and of course our own friends from the class of 1975. We hope that this is going to be one of the uh, first programs, second program by our class and others to discuss gender, race, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Almost 50 years ago, I packed my vinyl record albums, a secondhand couch, and I headed over Route 2 from North Adams where I grew up to move into Sage A1. Tonight, I'm thankful to be joined by five classmates, Lisa Harris, Suzanne Floor, Jackie Laughlin, Robin Geisler, and Nancy Reese Jones, Jones to discuss our own experiences, our observations, and our recollections of our times at Williams and the impact on our personal and professional lives since then. I want to take, I want to thank three other classmates, Kathy Bogan, who is going to help with curating your questions tonight, uh, Julie Behrens and Amanda Van Dusen. Together, we all mold over and shaped this program. I want to give a special shout out to Joe Bond and Gordon Earl, class of 75, for their encouragement for this and other programs past and future. We intend to chat for about an hour and then answer as many of your questions as we can until 9 p.m. Please send your questions to chat uh, to uh, Kathy Bogan with your name and class affiliation. And uh, we will, as I said, take as many as we can, but they will give us good ideas for future programming when we can't get to them all. So 1971, what a year. To put it in context, Richard Nixon was president. The Vietnam War was in our living rooms on TV and on our campus via the lottery. The environment was becoming a national issue and women and minorities were getting much more vocal about their quest for equality and equity. All in the Family was just beginning on TV. Mary Tyler Moore threw her hat up in the air in Minneapolis every week. A Clockwork Orange in summer 42 were in the movie theaters and Led Zeppelin first performed Stairway to Heaven in public. Starbucks opened on the West Coast. FedEx opened in Tennessee and Texas Instruments introduced the first pocket calculators. Life in some ways was simpler and that was true also in Williamstown. No internet, no cell phones, almost no women's sport teams almost no women's health care services. But all of that was starting to change. Our class of women, 133 at admission and 108 at graduation, came from public, private, co-ed, and single-sex high schools all over the country. We headed into biolabs, econ, history, English. And by sophomore year, we were spread all over the campus from Dowdy House to Armstrong. Tonight is a brief look at how we changed Williams and how Williams changed us. Let's get started with our panel. And uh, so you know, each of the panelists is gonna take a brief time to give you a snapshot of who she was back in 1971. And we're gonna start with Suzanne Floor. I'm sorry, we are gonna start with Lisa Harris. That's what I thought, okay. I'm just checking in to see, making sure everybody's awake. Lisa, you're on. <laughs> Thank you, Martha. I grew up in Northern California in a small rural town, minutes from Palo Alto. My father, uh, a physics professor at Utica College was recruited by Stanford Research Institute. So we moved to the San Francisco Bay Area when I was five. I had no experience of private schools. 
attending a large public high school where Joan Baez sang at anti-war rallies and Carlos Santana's band played one of our school dances. So it was hippies, not preppies. I had a rather romantic idea that I wanted the opposite experience, a small private liberal arts college in the Northeast. <clears throat> the idea to apply to Williams among the five I considered came from a neighbor whose wife I knew from the 4-H clubs. He knew that they were admitting women and offered to write a recommendation. Now, only last week did I find out that Al Schreck gave the inaugural gift for the African-American Studies Chair in 1965. I expect that his recommendation and my being from Washington State helped me get in. <clears throat> Excuse me. I never toured the college before arriving in the fall of 1975. I was used to co-education and my high school cohort included lots of male friends. I liked the novelty of being part of the first class of women and wasn't worried about being outnumbered. My major was art history. And since I planned to do a junior year in France through Hamilton College, I took lots of French. <clears throat> Senior year, I had the great opportunity to do an independent study with Whitney Stoddard, who suggested the topic for an honors thesis. But I had little idea of a path forward after graduating, perhaps museums. A year later, I enrolled in an arts management program at UCLA. I thought an MBA could help in getting an arts position, but more importantly, it was an insurance policy in case a job in the arts didn't work out. After a couple of brief jobs, one in nonprofit consulting, another in education, I married a fellow Williams alum from the class of 1976, joining him in the Soviet Union, where he was working for the first ever Soviet American joint venture. The details of my time in Nahotka at the eastern terminus of the Trans-Siberian Railroad is a Cold War story for another time. But out of that came a Soviet American art exhibition, my first job in a gallery, and a divorce. Shortly later, I founded my own contemporary art gallery in Seattle, Lisa Harris Gallery, renamed Harris Harvey Gallery in 2016 when I began the process of retiring. Without Williams and Art History 101, there would have been no gallery to make its mark on the Pacific Northwest art scene. I wouldn't have met my wonderful art appreciating husband, a graduate of Whitman College, a college modeled by the way, specifically upon Williams, and I wouldn't have had my terrific daughters. Our elder daughter attended Skidmore College. Do you remember how some of the Williams men, especially upperclassmen, would road trip to Skidmore to meet young women? Skidmore began admitting men in 1971, the same year that Williams was admitting its four-year class of women. In 2007, they still had more women than men. Our other daughter attended college in Boston, so she too felt the pull of the East Coast. Still, although Williams shaped my future in a big way, my children were having none of it. Thank Thanks, you. Lisa. Let's uh, go directly to Suzanne Floor now. Okay. Um, I arrived at Williams from the Philadelphia High School for Girls, a large Philadelphia public academic magnet school. As the name might suggest, it was all girls, young women. Um, I had never heard of Williams College. My parents received a postcard from a family friend who was a lecturer at Williams. It was a picture of the white congregational church on the screen. To me, it was a quintessential New England scene. I called our friend and asked him whether I should apply. He asked me if Haverford was co-ed. When I said it wasn't, his ringing endorsement of Williams was, yeah, I guess so. Back in 1970, applying to college was a much less fraught process than it is now, or even when our children were doing it. I was clueless. I arranged for an interview and my father drove me up to the Purple Valley. I must not have done much research because I told my interviewer I wanted to major in education. Of course, Williams didn't have an education major. For some reason, they didn't end the interview right there. Based on my application, my interviewer confirmed I played the oboe and intended to take at least one Spanish course every semester. I later learned that Professor Shaneman, the head of the music department, was desperate for an oboist. And by going co-ed, the college was hoping to have more students studying languages. I did my bit. I played in the Berkshire Symphony, and I was a double major in history and Spanish, 
with a concentration in Latin American area studies. I was the only Spanish major in our class. I have a letter from Mr. Cardillo, who was the band director, telling me I was the first girl in the Williams College band and that he hoped I would consider it some sort of honor. I don't remember feeling intimidated academically and I freely participated in class discussions. I did feel that classmates who had attended boarding schools were much more socially sophisticated than I was. However, I did have a co-ed group of friends, most of whom I met through my work study job in Baxter Hall at the Fresh Men cafeteria. There were some upper class men who seemed openly hostile to the idea of Williams being co-ed. Given Williams' social, uh, isolation, the weekend social dynamic was still for men to go on a road trip to Smith, Holyoke, or Skidmore. Some women at one point hung up a banner that said, date the Williams woman this weekend. In September of 1971, the drinking age in Massachusetts was still 21. I was 17. Our junior advisors had a meeting to discuss parietals. What is a parietal? That's um, rules about having when males would be able to visit. Spoiler alert, there were no parietals. Drinking rules were kind of lax at that time. At that meeting, I had my first beer ever. I shared it with my two sweet mates. Later, the college sponsored a freshman mixer complete with a keg. Our junior advisors, who were actually seniors, soon moved to Vermont. So much for being advised. When I told our neighbor in Philly that I was going to Williams, he teased me by saying, you're just going there to find a husband. I was a very serious student. I was furious. I showed him. I found two husbands. The one to whom I've been married for going on 39 years, I met sorting silverware in the freshman cafeteria. He was always supportive of my career as a lawyer. Early on, when I was going to negotiate my next year's compensation with my boss, he sent me off with the admonition, if you wimp, if you wimp out, don't come home. I ended up starting my own law firm. Um, I don't usually dress like a pirate. My current husband, a physician scientist, and I guess it's no secret, Steve Alvelda, has proven that he really meant that in sickness and in health thing. Thanks, Suzanne. And uh, we will go directly to Jackie, our most experienced panelist. Welcome back, Jackie. Hello, everyone. My name's Jackie Laughlin. You guys knew me as Jackie Strawn. And I got married my, oh, I guess my junior year at Williams and I became Jackie Meadows. And I first want to say what a delight it is to be here. I didn't know how much Williams shaped me, but as we've been celebrating these anniversaries, uh, I've been back 2009, then I came back 2019 in April, and then this, in the pandemic and hibernation, my my brothers and sisters, uh, Black alumni, call me back to recollect with them. And now this, this second time with the women of Williams has been just extraordinary. Our, our conversation, our connection. I didn't realize um, how much I missed you all and also how much uh, you shaped me. Um, I came from New York City. Uh, very much an urban girl, and I went to a fabulous all-girls high school, and two of my classmates, I'm sure you all know, Jean Tibbetts and Nancy Galt, uh, accompanied me, and I didn't really think a lot about coming to an all-male college. I think I got uh, uh, introduced to Williams, um, first by my neighbor. My neighbor went to Amherst. And when I mentioned Williams, he just like spit it out like, like I had just said the poison word. And he said, they have girls and you're going? I'm not speaking to you. You can't babysit my kids anymore. <laughs> and then I went to a really nice recruitment thing and I met Phil Wick and Phil Smith 
and a whole bunch of really amazing men. And um, I think I got hooked with the idea. Williams wasn't the only place that I was accepted, but I was really drawn in. Um, there was a young man named Vernon Manley, who uh, he and I became very dear friends. I miss him desperately. He died this past year. And I realized that I wanted to be more involved with the college and being more involved with you because you're part of my history, but because we're not promised tomorrow. So it has been fun. It's been really fun. I learned how to be in a world that was much broader than my own. My parents uh, supported my decision at Williams, but was hoping I would go someplace with cost a little less money. But since I said I wanted to go, they supported me uh, very much by being there. I loved the fact that Williams was a place that was intellectually stimulating and supportive, but I have to say not quite as stimulating and supportive as my high school. I didn't know how going to school with all men would be so very different from going to school with all women. So one of the things that I've enjoyed by us preparing for this time together is how much I miss the women, how much I miss uh, the classroom dialogue. When I was at Williams, I majored at AMSIV and I had a double major in um, psychology. And I also, um, I realized when I came back uh, last year that I was one of the first people to have the Afro-AM concentration. So I'm not saying that Williams invented African-American studies, but I think we've done it better than anyone. And I was most shaped by my professors and my classmates and learning how to take a subject from beginning to end from every different direction. And while as I fell at home there at Williams doing that, uh, we learned from talking to each other these past few weeks that we were different. Williams women were different. And I never quite wondered why I didn't fit in. I was thinking, well, is it black? Am I a woman? I think it's a little of both, but I think there's something extremely fabulous about having a liberal arts education, studying the humanities, having civil conversation and dialogue. I think our country is dependent on it and what we have here needs to be replicated so that our families and children can enjoy it. I became a mom at Williams, even though I, I laughed when Susan said we didn't have an education major. We didn't have a mom major or a wife major, but I learned how to be a mother and a wife at Williams. My husband did not go to Williams. Um, he went to Rhode Island School of Design, but we met uh, the summer before I started Williams. Uh, he worked at the ABC program and I came to participate in a pre-professional program and we met and fell in love and hung out in Newport, Rhode Island. And a lot of, uh, a lot of what I believe happened for me at Williams happened because I created very early on a support system that uh, nurtured me. My son, I don't know if I have the oldest son at Williams, but my son is 46 years old and he was born our senior year uh, at Williams. And I wanted to share with all of you that um, being a mom wasn't hard because Williams and my classmates and my sisters and my brothers made it possible for me. Um, a woman who realized that, no, you can't have it all, but you can't have everything without having love and support. Um, I guess the other thing that I really wanted to share uh, in my five minutes, they've all learned that I've long-winded, is that what we have, we cannot take for granted. We absolutely can't. We need to think about the things that we liked. We need to think about the things that were horrible and how to make Williams a better place for the women, for the young men, and how our society can join together and duplicate and replicate and get better at what we did there. There aren't a lot of places where we can do this now. And I think it's uh, 
a good opportunity for us at this time in this place. And I'm, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful for being with you all and discovering how much we had in common, how much time was lost. And we can catch up. So thanks. Thanks, Jackie. And we will now go to Robin. I knew it was going to be hard to follow Jackie, guys, and I think I was right. So <laughs> I'm Robin Durrell Geisler. It's Robin Durrell at, at Williams. And um, I grew up in Fairfield, Connecticut, outside New York, and attended public schools, also a, co -ed, a large public high school. So, and how did I end up at Williams? Um, my story was a little simpler. Um, I was in a summer program the end of my sophomore year, and I met someone who was interested in Williams. And that person talked it up and it intrigued me. So I went home and, um, and I went, looked at all my college books, which is kind of the way I did my research back then. And I thought that Williams was gonna be someplace that would work for me. So I got interested and happened to be going by it on a ski trip, I think, and saw it. And you know, it was a beautiful day and it just snowed. Everybody on campus looked happy, healthy and everything else. And, and I said, wow, that's exactly the kind of school that I wanna to go to. So I applied and, and it worked. So that's where I ended up. And the fact that it was, I was going to be in the first class that included women was kind of just a bonus for me. I wasn't, I thought it would be just fun. I looked at it as a fun event more than anything else. So when I got to Williams, um, I found the campus very um, welcoming. I did not feel that women were, you know, shortchanged really in any way. Um, at least my experience was not that way. The one thing that does stand out though was the, um, the fellows from the Greylock Quad who were general, a few years older than we were who would walk around campus on occasion wearing their co-eds go home t-shirts. And I can remember seeing those once in a while and I'd think, gee golly guys, you know, you need to grow up. We're here and the world's changing and you better jump on board and you know, grow up. So I always thought that was kind of funny. Um, I was an econ major, an economics major, I, um, and there were only four of us um, in our class. So I know I had some classes with, with generally with, with um, pretty much all men. But I, if I look back at my life at Williams, I don't remember that. It was something that it was just kind of a given. You just didn't even think about it. I don't think I had any women professors except for one um, the entire time I was there either. And um, again, I didn't notice it, but when I look back, I go, golly, that was kind of weird, it, you know, in retrospect. So um, the thing I did notice more than anything, and it's, I think it, I'm picking back on, on, I think what Suzanne had said was a little bit, is that the, at Williams, when we were there, I think it had a majority of kids from private school as opposed to public school. And um, I did notice, because I had come from this large public high school, I had done well in my high school, it all came pretty easily to me. I remember going to Williams and, and feeling like other kids were better prepared than I was. And I, and I think it had more to do with the private school, public school thing for me, but maybe it was just me and I was immature, I don't know. But I, I did not feel that, um, you know, it took me a little while to figure out how to, how to be the student I wanted to be there. Um, the spring of my sophomore year, I met um, a fellow who was two years older than me at Williams, Tom Geisler. And so um, we got pretty serious. And so my experience is different than most people in my class um, in that I did not really hang out with my class very much after freshman year. I was generally with Tom um, sophomore year. And, um, and then after he graduated, he moved to the Hartford area to attend law school. And so I was commuting a lot to get down to law school. And I arranged my schedule so that I would generally be able to get down there for three day weekends. So I wasn't on campus nearly as much as most people. I worked at the faculty house to make sure I had gas money. I went to you know, classes, I'd come home and get my work done. And then I would commute for three days a week down to Hartford for the most part. So I didn't really partake in everything that I probably, sh I, that I know I should have um, when you think back about it. Um, and then after Williams, um, Tom and I got married pretty quickly after I graduated and, um, and Tom was still in law school. So we moved to the Hartford area, which meant I worked in the Hartford area for one of the insurance companies. And then we had a bunch of kids and I stayed home with them for a while. And um, then we moved to the Bay area a little bit around 27 years ago. And so I now live in the Bay area and um, 
And I went back to school after moving out here and became a math teacher. So um, that's really the career that I think of myself as having is being a math teacher. Um, and that is, that's what I've got to say, so. <laughs> Thanks, Robin. And uh, we'll go to Nancy uh, and then we'll start uh, doing some questions in chat, Nancy. Boy, it's hard to follow everybody. Um, this is just so moving for me. It really is. I, I just, I, my eye glances down to the chats and I love, you know, like Ned Reed's comment about um, just watching the, the film strip or the, the you know, the, it just kind of moved me very deeply and just having everybody here. And as Jackie said, just connecting with all these women here, marvelous. Mm -hmm. um, I first set foot on campus probably as an eighth grader accompanying our classmate Roz Smith Ray and her parents to watch her older sons, or excuse me, her older brother Sandy, who actually graduated in 1969. He was a football player, so we were watching him play. It was one of those exquisite fall days when the Purple Valley couldn't have been more beautiful. I was smitten, and when I learned Williams was accepting women for the fall of 71, I applied early admission. It was the only place I wanted to go and I was accepted. I think I'm among many of us who think that wouldn't be happening now. <laughs> um, having grown up in Concord, Massachusetts, I felt right at home in yet another quaint New England town. Uh, Williams suited me very well. I would have been utterly lost in a larger university. I did go to public school through eighth grade, but then spent my high school years at Concord Academy, which was seven, house, seven houses walking down from our house um, to, to, the, to the Concord Academy campus. Um, the one drawback to Concord Academy for me was that it was an all-girls school at that time. Um, so in addition to guys and a gorgeous natural setting, Williams had the environmental studies program, which was a huge draw for me. Initially, it bothered me that environmental studies was a coordinate program rather than a major, but in retrospect, I'm glad because of my exposure to our country's history as an American civilization major, just like Jackie. I loved both AMSIV and environmental studies classes and kept notebooks and reading lists from many of them for decades. In fact, I think it was only four years ago during our last move that I actually threw some of these things out. A highlight for me was the several day trip to Mystic Seaport with Professor Ben Labory. At, on the other end of the spectrum, and this is funny coming after Robin, on the other end of the spectrum was Econ 101. Although my lowest grade by far of all my classes, I was so grateful for that C minus because hard as I tried, I simply couldn't grasp the, fu the fundamentals. Aside from Econ 101, I was well prepared for Williams academically, but woefully prepared, unprepared emotionally. My four years there were very tough, not because of external challenges, but internal ones. I struggled with debilitating anxiety and depression, which kept me from diving into activities that would have greatly enriched my Williams experience. I was so worried about not having enough time for my studies that I simply couldn't relax and enjoy the myriad other things Williams had to offer, such as spending evenings at the log, being on the nascent crew team. I love those pictures of Lee Nash and uh, Becky Fernald on the crew team. I always said that I would have loved that, but I just was too worried. I was too worried that I wouldn't get my work done or participating in the outing club activities. Those would have been terrific for me. In many ways, the saving grace of my four years at Williams was that I worked each summer as a seasonal at Rocky Mountain National Park in Colorado. Being away from what I perceived as the academically pressured East Coast enabled me to let down my guard somewhat. So it was no surprise that the day, the very day we graduated, I said goodbye to family and to Williams and drove to Colorado. In fact, Dave Reardon from our class and some other guy, we all drove out there that day um, in my uh, Grand Torino um, because we all had jobs starting like two days later, we just did one of those nonstop drives. The West represented personal freedom for me then and nearly 50 years later, it still does. I think of my 30 years in Colorado as the second chapter of my life. Although still lacking in confidence when I graduated, I believed enough in my writing skills from professor's feedback that I landed my first job as a writer editor at an environmental consulting company. What I loved most about Williams being surrounded by intelligent, interesting, curious and driven people 
I was actually able to replicate throughout my career, especially, especially in the many years I spent in the communications department at the National Renewable, excuse me, National Renewable Energy Laboratory. It was so much easier when it was the Solar Energy Research Institute. That rolls off the tongue. Um, I was an editor, a technical writer, and eventually a manager. My last three years in Colorado were radically different from the first 27. In 2001, I reconnected with Ken Jones, whom I'd met in 1969 when he was a wrangler and I was at a dude ranch. I was a dude at a ranch in Wyoming. And it's the same ranch that um, Warren Barker from our class, he, he and I compared notes at the last reunion. And we both went to that same little ranch, the Triangle X in Cody, Wyoming. At that time, our worlds couldn't have been more different. Ken had spent his formative years on the Wallapai Reservation in Peach Springs, Arizona, where, he, um, where his dad worked for the tribe and later at his dad's hard scrabble Montana ranch. But by the time we were married 34 years later, we each had had enough life experience to be very compatible. My third chapter is my Montana chapter. We moved to Ken's native state in 2005 when he retired from more than three decades in the guest ranch industry. We now live in a small town 25 miles south of Missoula with four horses and two dogs. Uh, trail riding is my main passion. During COVID, it's been the perfect socially distanced activity. But now that things are opening up again, I'm looking forward to getting back to being a hospice volunteer and coaching high schoolers on their riding skills. For the past nine years, we've also been snowbirds. We haul our horses and dogs to Cave Creek, Arizona and set up camp in a trailer alongside other horse folks. In fact, right now, that's where we are. We're packing up for a journey north on Thursday. Um, so I'm actually zooming from a friend's beautiful house and she's a quilter and she makes all these amazing quilts. I asked her if I could be in her house where it wasn't surrounded by boxes. In closing, I want to make a pitch about reunions. I'm a huge fan of reunions. I credit them with building the sense of belonging that eluded me at Williams. Our 10th reunion was a watershed moment for me, literally. I attended with the usual first time back since graduation trepidation. The meet and greet gathering the first evening went smoothly enough, but returning to that little single dorm room that night triggered a PTSD attack of sorts. All my demons from those years of feeling like an outsider, yearning to connect with others, but not knowing how, hit me like a tsunami, and I sobbed and sobbed. It was incredibly cathartic, like my own mini exorcism. After this meltdown, I was finally able to shake off the past and take my place, as it were, in our class for the first time. Since then, I've attended all but a few reunions and found them fun, fascinating, rejuvenating, both socially and intellectually. It means so much to me to visit classmates and establish satisfying connections that I only could have dreamed about when I walked the campus as a student. Thank you, Nancy. And of course, one of the silver linings of not having reunions is that we're also desperate to get together that we started to think about ways we could link together as we are tonight and hope to do in the future. And so for the next uh, couple of minutes, let's let's uh, ponder a few questions that we've talked about. Uh, I know that uh, when I realized Williams was going co-ed, I just thought, oh, I can go there now. I didn't anticipate or even think about anything other than uh, we would just you know, start as freshmen. So the first question, I'm gonna start with Suzanne. As part of the class, do you consider that you survived Ed Williams or you thrived or maybe some of each? And did you ever feel like a guinea pig for co-education? Because in some ways that's what we are as the, or what we were as the first class to go through all four years. Suzanne? Yeah, I didn't feel as a guinea, didn't feel like a guinea pig. And I think partly that's because most of my first year classes were actually with mostly freshmen. So I was with people who came to Williams knowing it was co-ed. Um, some of the older guys, you know, weren't quite on board, but we didn't have to deal with them too much and they graduated and they left. Um, I think I thrived at Williams. At home, I had been at this girls, all girls high school, um, again, very serious. Basically, my life was, you know, taking the bus and the trolley and going from home and 
going back to school. And at Williams, um, I, I had a, you know, a whole group of friends pretty quickly. I kind of regret that I started seeing my, seeing my first husband um, sophomore year, because I think that kind of took me away from more of a more rounded social life at Williams. The one thing that really, really um, made Williams special for me was the location. I came from a gritty city. I mean, we still know we're a gritty city. Um, and all of a sudden I'm in this beautiful place. And one of my life memories is walking from the language center, which I was guarding for work study. Um, and no one was around and I walked down through the campus back to <clears throat> Mission Park and the sun was streaming through the leaves that were turning colors. And then the carolines started playing. And I remember just saying, I gotta store this in my mind for when things aren't that good. <laughs> so, I, you know, I don't know if you call it thriving or not, but um, it, I, it was a positive experience for me. Okay, fair enough. And, and Jackie, let me jump to you on that question. Um, on surviving, thriving, ever feel like you were a guinea pig for this great experiment that Williams was embarking on? <laughs> um, I'm gonna reveal that we kind of discussed our questions in advance. And I think I've <laughs> changed my answers probably about five times. <laughs> I, I think there were times where I felt like I was barely surviving and drowning. And then there were times where I felt like I was really thriving. But that first year in particular, I wasn't sure. I, I, wanna, I wanna say that there were some people that I met that were really key to me surviving and thriving. Um, some of you may or may not know that there were women at Williams before we got there. We, we were the critical mass, but um, Suji Sutler, Bobette and Dusty, uh, Bobette was um, my, my JA and I was in Sage F. And um, they meant a lot to me. They were transfers in and they kind of helped me get the groundwork. Both of my roommates from Sage F have died. Uh, Barbara Banks and Marsha Ward. And I can't think about my first year of living in the dorm without thinking about all of those people. So that I want to honor them. And I want to, we, we talked about, we didn't have a Dean of Women, but, you know, Nancy McIntyre and, and specific people, like if I, if my butt was dragging, there were people there that would, were able to help me. I think the part about thriving at Williams is that I didn't know that I really was kind of a Renaissance woman, that I was interested in all sorts of things. Like I'm writing poetry now and I'm loving retirement and living with cows and all of that kind of stuff. Williams supported me in that anything you want to do, we'll help you do it. Just give us, give us a little more data about what you want. I, I, I think in an all girls high school, I had more supportive friends. Um, but the thriving part at Williams is that I, I knew how to make it, I think I knew how to make it work for me. The only other thing that I thought about that I wanted to answer about that question is that I was very much aware that I was an experiment. Uh, and it wasn't just in my head. You know, people told me, Jackie, you're an experiment. We don't know how this is going to work. You know, uh, they talked about that. Uh, uh, and in the admissions office, I think I was, you know, kind of a double bang for your buck. You're, you're black and you're a woman and from, and you're a really smart girl from a really smart high school. So we need to make this work and you need to be involved in helping us make this work. And I didn't, it didn't bother me. Um, I've talked with some other people about being cannon fodder and maybe being a little disappointed, but I realized that it was a, a little bit of an extra burden on me. Like, I wish I had known all of you better than like I'm getting to know you. Never too late. <laughs> I think we froze, I think Jackie's 
might have frozen. I think her screen is frozen. All right, we'll wait till we'll get her back, I'm sure. And let me move to Robin on that question. And again, you know, this is in the context of college is hard for everybody. So as I thought about these things, it's hard to figure out would, would it have been different someplace else? And, and some of the things that we all went through were because it was the 70s and because it was college. But, um, you know, particularly we had a great opportunity uh, and it's fun and, and useful, I think, to think back about, you know, what did that mean for us as, as we were going through that? So Robin, on that question of surviving, thriving, I think I know um, where your answer may be. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, um, I would say that I, I was closer to, to, to um, thriving than surviving. Um, I don't know, I, I, it, there's nothing where I, there was never a time at Williams that I thought I was failing at anything. Um, so, you know, but I, I don't know that I ever felt that I was totally on top of my game either. I think that um, I was always somewhere in the middle. Um, and one thing that, that Williams did, um, that I know it still does pretty much, is it allowed you a great deal of academic freedom um, because Williams had such broad um, requirements for your classes. And that's one thing that I thought was so fabulous. I know most, many of us have our own children who have gone to college. And you've you, you've noticed you know them going through the process of trying to figure out what they're going to take freshman sophomore junior year, and when you look at some of the other colleges and the way that they structured things, I'm I, I was just thrilled that Williams gave us so you know it just allowed you to grow the way you wanted to grow because I loved economics I it turned out I loved a lot about art history so I did a lot of art history courses and um, and I thought that was just empowering, um, and one thing that we talked about. Um, bringing into this question a little bit was mentoring. Um, I have to say that um, I I don't think I don't think I only remember having one woman professor. So I and I thought I had very nice professors, but I don't know that I ever got attached to anyone at Williams. There was one I had one woman for one English class once, and I can remember some comments she made to me. And I have to tell you, she made several comments, none of which were particularly consequential. But I remember her comments and I don't remember any comments from another professor. So that kind of tells you that you didn't connect with people and maybe that if you'd had, you know, people a little bit more, you know, a few women, it would have made a difference. And, um, and to go back to the, the JAs too, my JAs were absolutely lovely. And I met them that first night and I don't think I ever met them again. I think that they, you know, they kind of did their job on that first night and then they were kind of doing their own thing. I think that mine, I don't know if I shared them with Sage F because I was in Sage E or whether we had our own, but because um, I remember being down in the basement meeting them that first night. But um, I think that they, that's a lost opportunity too. And I know Williams does a much better job with it now. So um, I think it'd be, the J program is another place where you can kind of find some of that that um, sort of mothering along that you might need when you start out in a college to help you kind of you know feel your you know feel a little more grounded. Um, but um, anyway, so that was my experience. And all yeah, that. and just you know, obviously there were fewer people in the pipeline to be JAs, and obviously exactly. to be professors. I know a lot of folks in the chat room are talking about we did have women. They tended to be collected in certain mm -hmm. uh, disciplines more than others, but I think the the school was making an effort. And so you know, we'll at another time we'll look at where we've come in in. 50 years later, where, where is that? But for us, we were the pioneers. So opportunity right. challenges, all of those things. I just have to mention, unfortunately, I think we lost Jackie. She's on a farm in Maryland and she said her internet connection just bugged out on her. But if she joins us back, then um, we, will, we will welcome her. Um, uh, Nancy, let me go to you on that, the guinea pig question. Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a good question. Uh, striving or, or, or actually that's interesting. Did you survive or thrive? I, I was, um, you know, what was that word I just, I just said? But anyway, I, I strived. <laughs> I was always striving. I, I feel like I, um, I don't wanna say I survived. I, I really, I feel like I made the most of everything I could given my emotional state. I mean, to be honest, I ended up going to psychiatrist over in um, 
Oh gosh, what was the little town right over the border uh, in, in Vermont? In Bennington? Bennington. I went to a psychiatrist <laughs> whose office smelled like his huge, huge Newfoundlands. It was sort of in the basement. And um, I ended up on the strongest doses of Valium my whole senior year. Um, so I, in a way, I don't know how I got through really, but um, fortunately senior year, and I have to give a kudos to Tony Brown. He, I was in Dodd house and he was yes. just New doors down in Dodd. And I can't tell you what a difference Dodd House made for me. Um, I was in Dowdy House my sophomore year, Sage F, um, my freshman year, uh, Dowdy House, which was way the hell out of nowhere. It, it was I, a long way away. There. And then I was in um, Sewell House, which was next to Dodd, but it was terribly isolating, uh, just all women. Um, I would have been so much better in one of the co-ed dorms. I was just so happy to be in Dodd with others. So um, I feel like, I didn't feel like I was a guinea pig because I chose to be there. And as far as mentoring is concerned, I didn't seek out anybody, nor was I sought out. I felt like my professors, male and the few females I had, actually I felt found the male more, um, Oh, like they were maybe personally interested, uh, but I, um, uh, but I was very intimidated by upperclassmen. I hated going to those parties. They scared the shit out of me. I tried <laughs> to go, and I would just, you know, and I was never much of a partier to begin with. And uh, upperclassmen just, I, I, men in my class, I felt comfortable with, but upperclassmen just were very intimidating for me. <laughs> Thanks, Nancy and Lisa. Lisa, you're on, uh, you have to unmute yourself. There you go. So I think I was leaning more toward the just survived um, camp my first two years. And, you know, though I'd been considered a good student um, in high school and all that, I, I think when I arrived at Williams, I was having a little bit of the imposter syndrome. You know, am I good enough? Maybe I don't belong if I... I have to pull an all-nighter just to get my English paper done, you know, and I'm not so sure, um, you know, why I felt that way, but I had a little bit of anxiety too, you know, that's that like what Nancy was describing. I think the college could have done more maybe to help us bond with some other people or, you know, I don't know whether it'd be like a big sister, big brother situation, um, but, um, you know, like Robin was saying, I think it was a lost opportunity. Maybe we could have done, you know, kind of met more and just talked about what our situations were and say, hey, you know, I'm working on this project or whatever. Um, but I was grateful to be in a triple, both freshman and sophomore year. So I did have, you know, two other women that I was with, um, uh, at least sort of for kind of for the, the social, um, you know, needs or whatever that was very generalized. But I didn't do any extracurricular activities. And I do think that that would have um, helped me get you know, gain more friends and contributed to a, maybe a better sense of well-being and something more well-rounded instead of studying all the time. But I, you know, was really, um, you know, careful uh, to really think of, you know, to do my studies because it was a privilege to be there. My parents were spending a lot of money and all that. But I did feel a little isolated. Um, students who live near in nearby states, they could go home for the occasional weekend or, um, you know, sometimes they were going to New York or Boston and I didn't do any of that or I, I couldn't manage it. But I did eventually feel that I was thriving at Williams and certainly even in those early years when I was feeling stressed, um, perhaps just alone, I felt that I was thriving when I was attending a classical music concert. You know, they had them in Thompson and Chapin and, um, you know, there were performances from visiting dance troops. And then I did connect with a bunch of guys that were living in Morgan and I would go skiing with them and, you know, somebody had a car. And so I felt more connected and like was I was having fun and, you know, th perhaps thriving. So, um, you know, I was away junior year. So that was a little bit um, too bad in the sense that I lost, um, you know, track of certain people and, you know, came back a little bit of stranger, but I did have a very strong mentorship relationship with um, Whit Stoddard for the thesis. And like what Nancy was saying, uh, Dodd House was wonderful. I was living in Goodrich, so I had the small uh, situation of, you know, a few women living in Goodrich, but then going down to Dodd for meals. And 
you know, all those people that were, you know, freshmen with us. And I just felt like more comfortable with that whole group and we didn't have the whole upperclassmen um, issues. So that's my take on it. Yeah, and the good news is, you know, we have a 50th reunion coming up in 2025 and we have a lot of time between now and then to connect. And I'll just uh, reiterate what Nancy said. Um, part of this, uh, we're even working on this project tonight was fun getting together with folks and talking about some of these things. And we have a lot of other, um, you know, slices of the onion as we go forward to look at, uh, but tonight is just a first take at it. So thank you for that. I'm going to um, go to Robin for this question, and um, it's pretty specific. What would you say you appreciate or regret the most from your experience at Williams? And looking back on it now, uh, do you think about that differently? Uh, Rob, you're on, uh, just on you there, Robin. There you go. Got it. There you go. I just did it. Um, what did I appreciate the most? I would, I would say I, you know, having come from a high school, um, um, a public high school where there were a fair number of rules where I had a lot of pre-prescribed courses. Um, I appreciated the freedom of Williams, the freedom to be able to, um, you know, choose the courses I wanted and to come and go as I please to associate with the people I wanted at my own, you know, whenever I wanted to. That was something I really appreciated. I enjoyed my classes. I don't know if I truly got as much out of them then. I, I know when I went back to become a teacher, I took classes later on um, in my life. And boy, what you get out of a class when you're you know, 50 is a lot, or 45 is a lot different than what I got out of it at age 18. So yeah, I wish, I kind of wish I was, you know, had my, had had the wisdom of my age now in taking the classes then, because I would have gotten a million times more out of them than I did then. And I would have taken advantage, again, I don't remember my professor as well, but I remember, um, I, I, I think I, it wasn't that I was intimidated. I just didn't know to ask them stuff. I didn't know to develop those relationships. And I think I would know to do that now. So um, there was so much that Williams had to offer that I don't think I was sort of ready to get. Um, and what do I regret? I regret probably the fact that I was away so much to, you know, kind of what Lisa was saying. I was away a lot. I didn't go away. I went away one semester when I went uh, my junior year. But I, I also was away pretty much, you know, two or three days a week, most of my junior and senior year, which means I had a different experience. Um, you know, I went to concerts. I, I did stuff like that when I was there. But there's only so much you can do in two or three days if you're working and if you're going to classes and you're doing all those things. So um, and I miss the relationships I would have built um, had I been there more often. I was not in um, in, in Dodd House, um, but I had sort of Dodd envy, I have to tell you all, because um, <laughs> I did, because I was in Prospect House sophomore year, and then I, my um, Tom Geisler, the guy I married, um, was a member of the fort, and so then I moved to the fort, I think at the end of, of sophomore year, as my affiliation and um, from Prospect. I like Prospect, but I just felt like I knew people better at the fort. So then I, I moved to the fort and the, they put me for housing. They put me in Dowdy um, House, which for me was actually a good fit I, um, because it was, there was just a great group of people there, but they were all going to Dodd and I was going to the fort. So, <laughs> so I bonded with them on one level, but I didn't really bond with them on another, unfortunately, but they were great. They were probably the people I was closer to um, my last couple of years at Williams. That was probably the group that I was closest to. So um, anyway, that is, that's what I've got to say. So I'll let the next person go. I'm not sure where you're going next. Yep, yeah, we'll go, we'll go to Nancy. And of course, you know, who wouldn't have Dodd Envy? You know, you're only human. We had Chet Peter <laughs> and we had the old Williams in. Some of us had our own rooms and bathtubs. I mean, it was, um, that piece was unbelievable. Um, but Nancy, and uh, let's, well, I think I'll go through this one quickly. And then I think Kathy will turn to audience questions. So if you want to start, if we have some, um, start lining up some questions. Um, Nancy, what would you say you appreciate and or regret the most from being at Williams? Well, you know, I, I pretty much appreciate everything. I appreciate the people, the, the incredible natural beauty, the academics. Um, I really, I really love so much about it. 
Um, and I felt a huge amount of class unity. I really did. Um, in fact, I, I had a medical crisis in my junior year and I um, was out um, for a while and I, um, and, you know, I think I had to drop a couple of my classes and stuff. And I was so determined to graduate with our class that I kind of increased my, my load um, after that just to make sure I would because it just, you know, being part of this class just meant so much to me. And, and that's been reinforced by our reunions and so forth. As far as um, my regret, uh, you know, I, I basically I regret that I, I regret that I wasn't more like Julie. I'm sorry, but I'm <laughs> Julie Behrens was my freshman year roommate. And Julie, I'm sorry to embarrass you, but Julie has the best ability. And I just visited her in Lansing last year and had a blast. She has the most amazing ability to balance, uh, live a balanced life, to really have fun and really work hard. And I just couldn't do that then. And I'm much better at it now, but I'm also not working. But anyway, I just, I really looked at Julie and others and said, how do they do this? How can they go and play and have fun and, and still get their work done and do well? So, you know, I, I think that I, you know, getting back to something that um, I think Lisa said, I could have used counseling, there's no question. Um, and, but I wouldn't have gone to, I wouldn't have gone to anybody at, at, at Williams and said, I'm really falling apart. Um, but I just think that that's something, hopefully that it is more available to kids now, um, that there are people that they can go to, that there are really good counselors. I know we had a Dean of Women, but she did she wasn't in my brain at all. So that's all I would say. Um, great place. I would do it again in a second. Although I've said a million times that it would have been much better for me to go to Middlebury <laughs> in terms of, a, of, of sort of the co-ed balance. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't take the, the, you know, I never dated at Williams. I mean, may, maybe a few, a, there were a few, a few dates, but I was so overwhelmed that I just, I couldn't sort of have a natural balance to my life. And I think being in a place like Middlebury or that would have been at my other, my second, um, that would have, that would have been a better fit for me in many ways. Well, and Julie is still the glue that holds us all together as our class secretary, of course, uh, also from Dodd House. And, um, I think was our first female class president uh, elected at our fifth reunion and uh, continues to provide that sort of leadership. So yes, we all do wish we were Julie. Um, that needs to stop right now. <laughs> I don't like what I'm seeing in the chat at all. Uh, all right. I will go we'll, back to muting myself. We'll, we'll, we'll go, we'll let Julie uh, mute herself and uh, I'm gonna go to Lisa for this question. Um, what you most appreciated and or regretted uh, from your time at Williams. Is that supposed to be me? That is supposed to be Lisa, yes. Okay, great. It's, I missed it's you. Really, I, you moved around on my screen, so. <laughs> it's really fun to see these names pop up in the chat and I just wanna talk to everybody, but you know, we're, we're soldiering on here. So um, what I especially regret is not having four full years to explore other academic departments and courses by Williams professors. You know, some people, some of those professors were very celebrated uh, in a larger arena. Uh, for instance, I took, I took four semesters of language study and I just, um, is my video off? Okay, you can you see me? Okay. Yes. That's fine. It's all right. This is um, a learning thing on this this panel point of view. So uh, anyway, it's just because I was taking so much French, I didn't have the opportunity to take you know very much history or or any poli sci or economics. But on the other hand, the experience that I had abroad was groundbreaking for me on a personal development level, and so I did get exposure to another culture and then to to art living with a french family you know becoming fluent and all that all of those things shaped who i am today but i came back senior year and just wished i could do a fifth year um but my final regret i think has to do with you know not staying connected to <clears throat> to williams and even the professors there in the in the art department and to the so-called williams art mafia um, I guess I was a member of that in that I started, you know, an institution is <laughs> very different, you know, a gallery versus a museum, but 
Um, I think if I had known some of those people, it might have um, been helpful. And so I have, you know, a regret about not staying and, you know, connected enough to Williams and to people that were in uh, the same field. So no, fair enough. Fair enough. And, and Suzanne, we'll finish up this question with you. Uh, and then we'll go to Kathy and see if she has some questions for everybody. So one thing I appreciate about Williams is that Williams was really generous to me. Um, my father was a high school, high school art teacher, and they basically said, you know, this is how much money we can give you, wherever you can go for that amount of money, you can go. And um, after my first year, when I got a D plus in Economics 101, I don't know who else got this C minus, um, I got a letter one day saying, you know, Due to your generally high academic um, achievement, we're giving you a layman scholarship. And that took the loan portion of my tuition and made it into a grant. So I graduated not very in debt from, from Williams. Um, I think we all felt like we were posers, by the way. I think something like 70% of our class thinks we were in the 10% project where 10% of the class was admitted even though they didn't quite have the uh, qualifications. Um, so I think we all maybe were, or at least the public school people maybe felt a little intimidated. Um, and were, you know, it, it's at some point it dawned on me that I got in because they needed an oboe, but that, that was neither here nor there. Um, I also, and I'm surprised to hear this because in those days, not that many people studied abroad, but I did a semester in Columbia and lived with a Colombian family, attended a Colombian university, and that was a very positive experience. And one semester to be away was fine. And then I think I mentioned my regret is that I was involved with this guy for three years. And I think I stopped being as, um, connected to my women friends at Williams. Okay. <laughs> Suzanne, were you finished? I didn't mean to cut yes, you yes, off. Yes, yes, I'm finished. Yeah, yes, okay. I am very and, finished. Kathy, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Uh, I have one or two questions on my email, but if you uh, have some there, let's, let's dig in for the next couple minutes. Yeah, I have a, a few questions uh, that have showed up in the chat. Some of them may have been answered a little. I'm gonna start with one that I'm not sure our panelists can answer. Did the women athletes feel supported in their sport? I, I don't think anybody was an athlete on our panel. Ooh, what do you mean by that? Oh, no, I mean, uh, well, an official athlete. I was on the B or C team in field hockey. <laughs> right, well, okay. All right, Nancy, answer the question. <laughs> no, I'll just say that, um, no, I don't think we were well supported, uh, but I don't really blame Williams because it was all so new. Um, so that's about, that's about what I'll say. Uh, um, I really wanted to be on the crew team, but it really bothered me that they had to go so far away, even to practice, that it just seemed to take a huge chunk out of their time. But anyway, that's that's all I'll say. Can I jump oh. in here too? Just yeah, quickly. yeah. Okay, I was just gonna say I um I am not an athlete, believe me. But I remember trying out for the lacrosse team um, or joining what was the lacrosse team. I think it was probably my sophomore year. And it was a fledgling group, but there were, of course, you know, lacrosse is a big sport in parts of, of, of America. We had some really good lacrosse players. And then there were people like me that had never seen a stick before. And it was kind of so sad for those kids that really were, you know, they, they had always done serious sports and they got to Williams and there was sort of nowhere to put them, you know, for a while. And then I know William, the sports at Williams now are very, you know, are very serious. So it took a while to grow it, but I think it was hard at that growing stage if you needed, I mean, sports are a great way to connect with people and they add all mm -hmm. kinds of, you know, things to your lives. So anyway. We all had to do quarters of phys ed though. My uh, inventive um, uh, entry mate, Alina Jonas, decided to sign a bunch of us up for independent water ballet, which the college quickly approved. So uh, 
you know, we, we got away with stuff in that, but I think it was so new. They just didn't have the infrastructure for teams. And unless you had played on a team in high school, um, you, you weren't, you know, and we weren't necessarily chosen, I think, to come to Williams because we were great athletes, but that's just my guess. <laughs> Uh, here's, here's a question. What is one thing should Williams have done to be more ready for women students by the time you started? What's the one thing that the college could have done? I, I'll, I'll jump in with that, Kathy, because the, the thing that struck me was that, you know, we had this little tiny infirmary uh, and th they were barely prepared, I think, for male students. But per our conversations about emotional, mental health and physical health, um, they really weren't prepared for women coming in the 70s who were looking for gynecological services or uh, birth control, whatever. So that, that to me was a glaring omission that um, I and a few others worked on while we were there. I hope it's better now. <laughs> I'm assuming that it is. Any other panelists? What's the one thing Williams should have done to be more ready for Williams or for women students? There's a lot of uh, conversation in the chat about uh, putting plants in the urinals. <laughs> uh, here's another question. Did you have any special rapport with your first year advisors? I had Bud Wobis and his wife, Sherry, who were very supportive and stayed in touch over the years. I will confess, I don't, I didn't even know I had a first year advisor. So anyone else have a, have a response? I don't remember an advisor either. <laughs> I have no recollection of having an, a, a, yeah, an advisor. Me neither, yeah. I, I, I had Phil Canelon, who was a poli sci professor. I met with him once and that was that. <laughs> so, no, I didn't feel I, I didn't feel advised then. Um, Noreen Stack, who was a female professor, came. I don't know if it's our sophomore or junior year, but she was a Latin American specialist, and she was very supportive of me. She had studied in uh, South America, so she spoke Spanish. <clears throat> I did a winter study with her where we went to Mexico um, with a group. It was called uh, How Mexico Uses Its Past in the Present. Um, and it, it was a really interesting trip. Uh, so in that sense, I felt like I did have some guidance. And as I mentioned, our JAs were seniors and moved to Vermont pretty much immediately. So there wasn't any advising there. Were just the, did only the women have advisors or did everyone? I don't, I don't know because I don't remember mine. I think everyone. Oh. Can I just add, I know I'm not on the panel, but <laughs> I know exactly who our advisor was, Nancy and Lisa. Uh, and I think it was the whole entry. So Jackie too and Leslie, uh, Peter Frost. And I remember the first meeting he was interested in talking to one person, and it was one of Lisa's roommates, Annie Luce. Okay, this comes back to me now. It, he Remember had the, the program in, in uh, Kyoto. He, he had the Williams in Japan program, so he was probably very interested in talking to Annie Luce about that. And he was probably gone for part of the time we were there for that uh, program. I had forgotten about that. I almost did that program in Kyoto. I'm glad I did not. Um, but, it, it, you know, Williams had very few of those. The Mystic Connecticut we talked about and, you know, but there weren't that many um, official study abroad programs. Who would want to leave Williamstown? It was such a gorgeous spot. Kathy, we probably have time for one or two more questions. It, I have one if you don't. Uh, there is a question. Did you find a mentor at Williams? And if so, who was it? I guess I already answered that. It was Noreen Stack. Um, she had a hard time as a young woman professor at Williams. She was not, um, 
the history department was kind of stodgy. And I think it was very difficult for her to be there, but she supported me anyway. I, I, um, I've been thinking while you are talking, I, I don't think I had someone that called themselves a mentor. Um, having gone, like I said, to an all girls high school and having such strong women influence my academic and social life, I didn't have a single female professor at Williams. But when I went to Brown that year, I did. And when I went to Brown, I wanted to study um, anthropology. I wanted to study culture. I studied Du Bois. And I think that for me, um, other students mentored me. Um, I saw in the chat, uh, Fred Rudolph. Fred Rudolph was a great uh, academic mentor for me. Um, Professor Joe Harris was a great mentor for me. I really think that um, uh, if you didn't seek out someone, it, it, it would be hard to know who that person is. But I, I have to say anyone that I sought out was helpful. And then um, <laughs> back to the GYN thing, when I, when I got pregnant and I was married, William said, oh my goodness, we <laughs> your health insurance doesn't cover um, maternity leave and are you gonna be all right? And, and so if they dropped the ball on anything, I think if they brought it, if you brought it to their attention, there was a lot of room for scrambling to, to make it work. I think for those people on the line that are just listening, we were first, we, we, they had to figure it out with us. And um, I'm, I'm more acutely aware of that. And I guess what I want for women that I know there now is that they have us, we, we didn't have them, we, they have us. And I, and I have had the pleasure of um, working and reaching out with other uh, Williams students. I've, I've brought them uh, into my home. I've done some uh, outreach and so forth. And I, I would like to encourage us to do that. And then the other thing I'd like to say is that I think that Williams for being you know, the elite uh, private institution really instilled in me the importance of public service, you know, people talk about being the 10%. I, I felt like I was not bad way 10%, but too much is given, much is expected. And I felt like a lot of people, uh, it didn't feel like a burden, but that I, I had to go out and do good in the world. You know, whatever profession I chose uh, to have integrity, I felt like that was expected of me at William. And then when I went out into the workplace, they were like, oh, you're from Williams. So yes, we know you're like that. I don't think they knew what to do with me because I was a woman, but I think that I did get that sense that I was supposed to do something special, that I was supposed to help other people and that my uh, intelligence and my view of the world should be done for, for good. You know, you should represent us well, it should be done for good. I have one more question from the chat before we go to yours, Martha. How did the women of 75 feel when Maude was named president of Williams? Yay. <laughs> I almost cried. Yeah. I hugged her when I met her. <laughs> I hugged her. Probably it was about time that Williams has always taken its time to plan and do things right. And look, these processes of picking presidents are, uh, I happened to be a student on the search committee uh, when John Chandler was chosen for president and it was a very interesting process. Um, it's a little bit of luck and it's a little bit of magic and some of it's all preordained anyway, but um, no, and she's been a great, uh, choice for the school. I mean, what tougher time to lead a college like Williams than through this year. And uh, she and the faculty and the students, from what I can tell, have done an extraordinary uh, effort at keeping people connected, keeping them healthy, keeping them on campus if they want to be. Um, but more than that, she's got a great vision for the school. And so I, you know, look, this has always been about 
making sure there are no barriers to people in the world to do the jobs and have the careers and have the lives they lead. That's all this is about. Women are no better or worse, except for some things, maybe we're better, but we're no better or worse than, than men. And the whole idea of being able to go to Williams and get that college education was to give us the choices that we could then do, as Jackie said, you know, go into public service, as I spent a lot of my life doing, or um, follow Lisa's path, or uh, any any of the women in our class have made choices around their personal lives and their professional lives, and they're all very different. I mean, we are a diverse group, even among ourselves. But you know, I'll, I'll just say I think Williams helped us. Uh, get the foundation and it hasn't really come up tonight but we've talked a lot about is for all the toughness we went through once we got out we didn't have to put up with a lot of stuff in the real world because we were used to it we knew what it was like to be in a classroom full of men or to be with teachers that you know weren't that welcoming and that's probably another another topic for another day in terms of whatever tough times we went through it Williams probably helped prepare us for uh, the things that we did afterwards so that's that's more than my two cents worth on on our president, but uh, it it was about time. All right, shall I do one more question and then then we can go out tonight? Yeah, um, this is from Alicia Tory. Uh, in our class. And she says, I'd love to hear about how different women thought about careers um, as we got towards senior year, whether they felt that they had enough help in thinking about careers or professions. I think we all approach that a little bit differently, um, but maybe we could get a quick answer from each of the panelists on, uh, in terms of what you thought about at Williams, with Williams about your career. Why don't I, Suzanne, why don't I start with you? Unmute? Yeah, I just unmuted myself, yes. Um, much like I was clueless about going to Williams, I was kind of clueless about what to do after Williams. I took the GRE and the LSAT just in case. Um, I ended up working for two years as a paralegal at a local legal aid society and I got to use my Spanish in that job. And eventually I sort of looked around and said, I'm doing the same things that the lawyers are and I might as well go to law school. Exactly. So it's a little bit haphazard, um, but I ended up being a lawyer. And you know, if you're a history major, you know how to read and write. <laughs> so that kind of works out in the legal profession. Jackie, do we still have you? Yes, I'm here. And, and <laughs> I, I don't see you on my screen. That's great. What about for you in terms of Williams and, and any thinking about or helping think about what you would do uh, to earn a living? Um, it's a really good question. I, I really wanted to go to graduate school. And I thought that at the time I wanted to... Uh, you know, teach, be, um, you know, be an academic. And then I had this little baby <laughs> and I had to figure out how to be like this brilliant Williams person, do good in the world and be a good mother, you know? And, and that idea, I really love the way that we've all talked about doing the juggling and the balancing and figuring it out. And um, I have to say my parents were really helpful in, in being supportive. But when I left Williams, I went to Howard University, a historically black college, and several of us left Williams and went there because we needed that. We needed the support. Uh, we needed, um, uh, th there's a long pipeline from Howard, um, Hampton, uh, Williams, and we followed a long tradition. Many of the people who went to Williams in the early years, you know, because of segregation, couldn't teach there, couldn't be scholars there, but this this following this train to Howard was really good. So I got my master's there in counseling and I did go to graduate school. And I felt that at Williams, they gave me the confidence to think that I could be whatever I wanted. What was missing for me was this sort of, um, mentorship that I experience now. Like if I'm having a tr trouble on a job, 
I didn't realize I could call, I could have called one of you, you know, I, di I didn't, I didn't have that level of networking. And um, as far as career choices, I know it sounds silly, but at the time, so many doors were closed to us as women. You know, I, I felt much more the, the pull of sexism than I did of racism, though it probably they were equal at the time. I didn't realize that. But, but being the first woman or behaving in a way, having very high expectations about how you should function in the workplace was something that I, um, it's not a regret. It's, I think it's a sign of the times. It's, you know, 1975 and 1980 is different from 2021. Yep. No, thank you. And I, we are coming um, to the close of this program. And I want to thank, obviously, our panelists and our terrific and very active on chat audience. Uh, some of these questions and topics tonight, I think, uh, will bear some drilling down on in the future, particularly this idea of careers and balancing and uh, professional lives and personal lives. But I, I just, in, in preparing for this, I thought, you know, if there's students who are entering Williams now, young women who are going to be in the fall class, um, listening to our panel tonight would have been like us listening to the class of 1921, telling us about what Williams was like. So in some ways, um, we were a snapshot in time, uh, but we continue to be a strong force uh, in our lives and with each other and with Williams. And so I appreciate that. And I hope that, um, you will uh, stay connected with all the great stuff the Alumni Society is doing online. Uh, there are great stories on their website, uh, great way to reconnect and connect with people. So with that, um, Kathy, is there, if there's anything, anything else you wanna close with? Kathy's probably on mute. All right, I will um, sign off for us. You can stay in the chat room if you like and uh, Stay tuned for some more pictures and music. And thanks very much. Thanks to Williams and the Alumni Society for helping us make this work so well tonight. Good night. <laughs>